and uh, in today's lecture we wish to cover these things we wish to talk about how strain is measured the fundamentals of strain measurement and analysis uh, what do we mean by geological strain markers uh, we will see examples from 1d 2d and 3d then uh, we will see strain measurement from linear markers see strain measurement from spherical mar mar markers uh, there is some uh, very typical technique which we call fry method or center to center method that is what we will see and we will ultimately see how uh, as we, we as we said previously that our ultimate aim will be to plot strain measurements in the flin diagram that we have discussed in the in the previous class so how would we plot our measured strain in the flint diagram. So that's what we are going to see today. So the concept of strain measurement and analysis. So strain, strain can be retrieved from rocks to a range of different methods, OK? So much attention uh, paid to one at two-dimensional strain analysis in deformed rocks, OK? Three-dimensional strain analysis uh, are done as well. Uh, but um, you know people do mostly two dimensional strain analysis and then try to infer it from there we'll see how it is done later so strain analysis gives us an opportunity to explore the state of strain in rocks and also to map out strain variations in sample and outcrop or a region okay the shape and orientation of strain ellipse or ellipsoid so depends on whether it is in 2d on 3d may contain information about how the deformation occurred okay the orientation of the strain ellipsoid is also important particularly in relation to the rock structure say for example in a shear zone setting we will see what is a shear zone shear zone is nothing but a zone of intense shearing shear sort of deformation it may tell us the deformation whether it was a simple shear or not Again, if it was a simple shear, whether you know uh, it was a dextral type of shear or a, a sinistral type of shear, the strain in a folded layer helps us to understand the fold forming mechanisms. And strain markers in sedimentary rocks allow for reconstruction of original sedimentary thicknesses. We'll see how these things are done both in our uh, theory class as well as in the lab class. Uh, with time okay so the first thing that we have to understand while we try to measure strain uh, we have to understand what are geological strain markers so we have already talked about strain markers and uh, we have used the analogy of a sphere which transforms to a uh, to a to an ellipse, ellipse or an ellipsoid depends whether it is on on 2d or 3d so that is essentially a strain marker right uh, and we have discussed about one of the experiments where we made a slit inside and then uh, tried to see how the velocity uh, fields were actually changing, if you remember. Uh, there also we have used certain strain markers which were square grids to understand the deformation pattern in the whole model, right? So similar to the experiments or similar to the theoretical examples that we had provided, there are uh, strain markers which are present in the field okay uh, in the in the rocks itself that would help us to essentially uh, understand the type of strain amount of strain orientation of strain so on and so forth okay so we will see how these things are done so uh, a good strain marker you can also call it a strain gauge is what uh, with known origin or shape or geometry uh, and with angular relationship okay so that means uh, as as you know that in the in the in the field in a real uh, real life example what we would find is a deformed structure right is a deformed deformed shape so a strain marker is a good strain marker whose original shape is already known to us we we do although we are not finding at that particular rock but we already know that how this one without deformation looks like okay so such things will be useful as a 
good strain marker. The common shapes used in strain analysis include sphere, circle, ellipse, bilaterally symmetric forms, and forms without bilateral symmetry. All of these things are used for as strain markers, right? And we'll see such strain markers in a moment. Uh, structural geologists use a variety of strain markers, example, fossils, conglomerates, deck shears, oolites, plastic grains, grain aggregates, reduction spots, uh, amygdules, lapillies, boudins, burrows, desiccation cracks, etc. In addition to buckle folded layers, rotated planner markers, um, yeah, all these things you know are used for strain analysis, and we will see such examples in a moment. Okay, <clears throat> so you can you can observe here, you know, uh, that in the first picture there is the picture of a of a molluscan fossil, okay, of a um, you know, belemnite, as we call it, the belemnite. You know, we know this belemnite how it looks uh, in real life. Okay, uh, without any deformation in its live form, how it looks, we have a pretty good idea. Okay, and you, we we know that uh, you know it almost forms a straight line and everything. Okay, and this is a fossilized belemnite, of course. In this particular case, I don't particularly find any strain. Because I can see that the original shape of that particular uh, animal is kind of retained. Okay? So we know that uh, you know perhaps this is unstrained because we already know how this one particular you know in its original shape looks like. Okay, uh, but of course if it is if it is deformed, I should be able to understand uh, the type of deformation that it had gone through while the fossilization was going on. Or after the fossilization process. Okay, now a simple bed, okay, which is in in general horizontal, that can also act as a act as a uh, strain marker simply because uh, you know its original shape is kind of known to us. Uh, not only that, uh, <clears throat> the beds, the sedimentary beds, in this particular case, I think it's a alternate laminations of coal. These back layers are coal or Coalie shell, shelly coal, something like that, or um, in between sandstone or limestone, this white stuff. So there is a intercalated layers of black and white stuff, as you can observe here. But fundamentally, they're horizontal, right? Now, <clears throat> the sedimentary structures it's, itself always might not be horizontal, so we have to be careful that sometimes we observe that there are sedimentary layers with uh, something called cross stratification. Okay. Know what happened? Something called cross stratification. So, what do I mean by cross stratification? You can observe here that there are some horizontal layers, yeah, and within those horizontal layers, there are some, you know, like inclined layers. Okay, they are they are called cross stratification. <clears throat> And they are typically formed due to ripple or dune migration. They are typically formed by ripple or dune migration. And we will see when we study sedimentology how such cross stratification forms. But you have to remember that any inclined bed doesn't necessarily mean <clears throat> that that is deformed, okay? Because these are these are nothing but sedimentary structured, okay? They are sedimentary depositional structure. They have not formed due to deformation. So with your trained eyes, you should be able to <clears throat> you know, distinguish between a cross-stratified strata and something, an inclined bed which has formed due to deformation. Okay. So all these things can be used as strain markers. Let us look at uh, for some other uh, strain markers, for example, this the first picture that you observed are called voids. This bed, bed will be called an oolitic bed, okay? And they are like we they are like spherical grains of carbonates, okay? Spherical grains of carbonates, and they are generally formed, you know, in the high energy environment. 
but how they are formed and everything you will understand them in your sedimentology class but the fundamental thing that you have to understand here originally they are spherical or originally they are <clears throat> they are they are, they are circular in a, in a particular cross section okay so if i observe an oolitic bed which is you know kind of elliptical i know because they form as as spherical objects that there is some sort of deformation that must have that must have happened just a moment guys uh, i just need to take this call hello class ki chi bolo bolo ट is has formed elliptical shapes okay so if i know that these uh, buoids are originally uh, spherical or circular in in cross section i i know that uh, there must be some sort of deformation going on okay so that is uh, that in this particular case these buoids can be used as strain markers okay so, or for example the this one as you can see this is a humble reduction spot what do i mean by that that is for some reason the rest of the place has been has been oxidized and there is a color color is red and maybe something was there was stopping that oxidation to happen so hence i see like a circular reduction spot okay so this reduction spot can also you know get deformed they they are typically circular and if i find the reduction spots being you know elliptical i know that there is some sort of deformation okay and by looking at the um, at the shape of this deformed strain marker i can comment on the type of strain okay these are nothing but burrows what do i mean by burrows burrows means uh, for example i have a uh, like in the beach you will find you know there is maybe a crab or something you know dig out inside the ground you know and form a small burrow okay it's living place like a crab okay crab was supposedly here now when this whole rock gets lithified you you will find that this burrow also gets lithified the burrow is also gets fossilized now typically these burrows are straight okay typically these burrows are straight but if i find a rock where i find that these burrows are like deformed you know as you can see here okay these are burrows if they are deformed i know that this rock has suffered some sort of deformation and i can measure strain from such uh, burrows as well you can see here how the burrows in the plan view look like you know like a, like a small hole and then there is like a tube inside okay that is the place where this small organism used to live and then this whole rock got fossilized and the burrow got fossilized as well together with them okay this sort of fossils are called trace fossils okay trace fossils means say for example so once upon a time the dinosaur walked on the land and you might see its preserved leg prints okay it's not exactly the animal but it's some sort of behavior that has been kind of fossilized for example here the uh, house of a, a small animal has been fossilized that is what we call as a burrow uh, and we know the shape of a burrow if i if i find that the burrow is deformed in some sort of uh, in, in in some in some sense they are typically cylindrical if they are not cylindrical we will understand that perhaps some sort of deformation that has gone into now of course there are uh, pebbles and conglomerates okay 
we know the shape of the pebbles and conglomerates that are that are present in the sedimentary sequence. If I find some sort of deformation, I will see that it loses its original shape, and I can measure strength from them as well. A uh, variety of fossils are generally used for uh, measuring strain as well. Um, you can see here there are four types of fossils here. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, the, the first one is perhaps a brachiopod. This one is a this one is perhaps a brachiopod. I'm not sure, but this is perhaps a brachiopod. The the second one is a is a trilobite. Okay. That that actually formed around five. You know during. Um, during the Cambrian time, uh, this is the fossil of an ammonite. And this is the fossil, uh, you know, the, the 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 spiral of an ammonite is kind of fossilized. Okay, the moral of the story: all these shapes are known to us. Okay, all these shapes are known to us. Now, if I find a deformed shape of such uh, such 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 things, we know that there is some sort of deformation going on, and these can be used as strain markers. Okay. <clears throat> now, for example, uh, here I am looking at a, a belemnite fossil. Okay, so this belemnite fossil, when it was when it was formed, okay, this was a continuous piece of material, right? It's a continuous piece of material. Now, when I am observing this one, when I am observing that this particular fossil has been budinaged. Budinaged means has been fragmented. Okay. We will see what boudinage means in greater details later on. For the time being, I can see that this is fragmented. Okay, so you know there is space in between. Okay. So what I can do, I can measure this whole length. Okay, and then I can you know measure these small gaps in between. I can measure these small gaps. So if I if I so that the whole length will be my L1 and L1 minus the gaps will be my L0. That is the original length, right? And then uh, by you know L0 by L1, we can actually find out. So the initial length, you know, is L0, which is nothing but the total length minus uh, you know all the, the, the smaller fragments, of course, or we can get the zero by adding these smaller fragments together that is also possible and then this is the final length so i can i can simply calculate elongation from this particular strain marker was the was this uh, uh, example clear to you everyone how we are calculating a strain from this particular fossil can someone confirm did you understand? Hello? Can you hear me, guys? Hello? Am I online? Hello? Yes, sir. OK, could you understand what I just said? Yes, sir. You got it right. Okay, okay. Just, just tell me. Otherwise, sometimes I feel that uh, uh, you are all gone, and then I'm just speaking to uh, the computer. Okay. Okay. So you understood how the strain has been calculated from this particular strain marker. Okay. So similarly, let us see some more examples. Here also you can see that this uh, black layer, which is the amphibolite layer, this black, black layer, which is the amphibolite layer, which has also been budinaged and also folded. Okay, So this layer has been budinaged and folded. That means it has been fragmented and folded. Okay, So you know we can join this thing together. We can join this thing together. And like the earlier example, I should be able to I should be able to find out strain here as well. Okay. <clears throat> so when we go to the field sometime later, we will do such exercises and understand how we can calculate strain in the field itself. Okay. Like the previous example, we can calculate strain here. We have to we have to consider. So here there are two types of strain, of course. One is that we can calculate the longitudinal strain.
<clears throat> and then there is of course there is some sort of strain due to folding okay i have already explained how the longitudinal strain is actually calculated i have not yet talked about the strain due to folding we will talk about it after we discuss folding okay so that is the that the, the total strain will be like a culmination of, of both okay for the timing you only know about the calculation of longitudinal strain how it can be done from a boudin algebra now you can see here that uh, a similar amphibolite layer okay has been you know not only fragmented and has been severely folded there, there the folding was not very not very prominent but here you can see that this whole layer has been severely folded also has been fragmented right also has been fragmented so here i have to consider i mean in the last example maybe we can um, we can um, we can think about ignoring the strain due to folding but here i have to consider very seriously the strain uh, due to folding okay but here also i can i can see i can calculate the longitudinal strain by uh, adding things up like in the in the in the previous example but then also we have to consider the uh, the, the strain due to folding in this particular case too now here uh, the example with the trilobite so we know this is the original shape of the trilobite and then you can see say if this is the sorry if this is the mid rib of the trilobite okay i can observe that these fins are actually kind of perpendicular to them right in the original shape but what i am observing here i can observe that the there is some sort of this so this is the fossilized trilobite and i can see that this that that is um, you know fins have taken an angle right it has made an angle now why why would it made an angle there is perhaps some sort of shear okay? some sort of shear okay so i can actually find out this angle xi okay and tan xi would provide me the shear strain right this would provide me the shear strain. So this is the kind of because I already know the original shape. I know the deflection. This will provide me uh, a direct evidence of how we can uh, calculate strain from this uh, from this uh, from this particular deformed trilobite. Okay. Now let us observe this one. You know. uh we can see that along in this particular so there are several layers in this in this particular photograph yeah like like some black and white layers okay and these black and white layers are the original geometry like this okay and then i see here some sort of you know some sort of shearing going on in this zone some sort of so i can actually calculate the angular strain here as well like the example we had shown previously we can calculate the angular strain here as well right just by looking at the deflection okay because this is this is the original original uh, shape of the layer which is supposed to be horizontal but i can see that along this zone along this zone there is a deflection this is perhaps a shear zone okay a small scale shear zone along which this this sort of deflection is going on we will forget about what is shear zone and everything we will discuss later on for the time being i'm only interested to calculate strain from this uh, particular uh, bed marker here there is no fossil or nothing it's simply the beds which has been deflected and by looking at them i can uh, calculate the uh, the strain that is that it has gone through. now suppose we have talked about these oolites you remember the the oolites okay. what we said that the oolites are fundamentally the oolites are fundamentally you know spherical and they are circular in in a two dimensional outcrop okay they will appear as circles now for example i am in a i am observing a particular 
um particular section i am observing a particular section a 2d section and i see that this is the type of shapes of all the oolites present there and i want to calculate the bulk strain what do i mean by bulk strain bulk strain it means you know i can calculate the strain of an individual grain I can calculate the strain of an individual grain, but I can calculate also the strain of the total material. Okay, the average strain of the total material. You know? So there will be some differences between strain from this grain to that grain to this grain. Okay, so we want we are not interested in that. What we are interested in is to calculate the strain of this whole material. Okay, so how we can do that? You know, so we know this is my initial. shape and this is my final shape right this is what we know from our experience this is what i am observing so, <clears throat> so the, the 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 prerequisite i mean the 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 things that we are looking at that there is only one section is exposed objects were initially spherical we know that objects were spher initially spherical that is our assumption the strain magnitude <clears throat> so the, there is no information about the initial size we don't know so we cannot exactly talk about the, the strain magnitude but we can actually talk about the strain ratio so what we have to do what we have to do is essentially <clears throat> we have to measure the length of the long axis of all individual ellipses yes measure the length of the long axis okay. and also measure the length of the short axis okay in all the grains okay and then i plot it short axis versus long axis okay short axis versus long axis and then if i find that they are kind of falling in a straight line you know like a i can fit a linear regression to through, through them okay i know that <clears throat> this has been deformed so i know that Uh, one of the interpretation i can make this has been deformed by a, you know a um, single phase of deformation okay so that means i can say that is the same pressure that has come from everywhere that has deformed the rocks it's not like you know i have a i have a piece of rock that i am produced i am providing some sort of pressure here and some different type of pressure here some different type of stress if that would have been the case they would have uh, they would have they would have not been following the same straight line okay if we can see that they are following the same straight line i know that you know i know that they are kind of uh, they are kind of uh, you know uh, product of the same deformation okay and then i can calculate this uh, this ratio which is nothing but the slope of this line so i can calculate the slope of this line okay. and um, you know tan theta actually which will be you know this length by this length anyway and <clears throat> that would provide me is the something called strain ratio calculate strain ratio now we are going to look at another another method which is called fry method of course we are going to discuss about fry method in details in our in our uh, laboratory Okay, and uh, I, I know it was not going to be very clear for you uh, in this particular uh, discussion, but of course, when you do it in your uh, with your you know um, with a live example, you will be able to uh, understand this in a in a better way. But still, let me take you through the basic um, uh, basic assumptions of this particular particular method, and then we will discuss about this method in greater details when we do. laboratory okay so 
this Fry method was actually proposed by a scientist called Fry and Hena and Fry in 1979. So there are some assumptions. So before deformation, here also we are talking about spherical objects which deforms to ellipsoids. Okay. So here also we are thinking about spherical objects that deforms to ellipsoid. And here we are not only restrict our not we are not going to restrict ourselves only in finding out the strain ratio we are going to find out the strain magnitude okay and we want to see how we can do that okay so these are these are some of the some of the assumptions behind this particular technique so before deformation the center of the spherical objects had an isotropic and uniform distribution that the distance that is the distances between the neighboring centers were statistically uniform it can be used even if there is a ductility uh, contrast between the spherical objects and their host matrix. Don't, don't worry about this, this part. You don't know about this thing yet. Let's not be bothered about this right now. For the time being, let us just concentrate on, on the first particular uh, sentence. Okay. So the centers of the spherical objects had an isotropic and uniform distribution uh, the, that is the distance between the neighboring centers are statistically uniform okay so what do i mean by that suppose i have uh, no like they are neighboring grains so let's say this is the grain at the center so this is before deformation okay and then i can actually measure you know the distance between the center of each grain. Okay. Now suppose then this is the central grain and it will again have few other grains at its neighboring place and then I can I know these are the distances between their centers. Okay? So now say take, if I take an average of these distances from this central grain to its all other grains, and then if I take an average of the distances between you know, this central grain and uh, other grains, what I will observe that they are more or less the same. Okay? So that is what we want to, that is what, what is our primary uh, as assumption. Okay? You understood my point. So it is not like that, that there are some grains where, you know, the, the neighboring grains are extremely far from each other. Or there are some grains where, you know, the neighboring grains are extremely close to each other. Okay. In other part of the rock. So that is, if, if such things are, are present, this particular method will not work. I am not saying that the distances has, has to be exactly the same, but they have to be similar. Okay, Is that point clear? Okay. Second point is, when the set of points with statistically uniform distribution is deformed, the average distance between the neighboring points in any direction increases or decreases in the same ratio as the length of the marker line in the direction. Okay. So what does it mean? That uh if these distances are kind of uh uniform and when they are deformed the average distances between the neighboring points in any direction increases or decreases in the same ratio okay so either the the after deformation the uh dif distance between two points will either increase or it will decrease right it will not going to remain the same but the ratio at any direction will kind of be similar, okay? It is not going to be disproportionate, okay? The maximum increase takes place in the direction of the long axis of the strain ellipse. The average distance between the points decreases the most in the direction parallel to the short axis of the strain ellipse, okay? That is another assumption, okay? And the axial ratio of the strain ellipse and its orientation is determined by the classical method. Okay. Now I will explain with a picture. Now this is the <clears throat> this is the first picture. You can see uh, what I was meaning. You know, 
from each individual grain i can identify its neighboring grains and then i can measure its distances from each individual grain i can do that and i will i will be able to uh, say that the statistically the distances are kind of uniform and this is undeformed since i can see that the epsilon 11 is zero okay now it is deformed so that means i am kind of providing a uh, pressure from the from uh, from the from the top okay and i can see that the circles have become elliptical and of course the distances have changed i mean the individual mutual distances between two points have changed okay somewhere they have increased somewhere they have decreased okay um, and then with further with further uh, deformation you know the um this these the circles become even more elliptical even more elliptical the ellipticity is keep on increasing and the distances the, the distances from the centers are also increasing and decreasing so the moral of the story is if the strain ellipse looks something like this okay if the strain ellipse looks something like this then the individual distance between the the average individual distance between two points will increase statistically maximum in this direction and it will decrease most in this direction okay so if i at the end if i know in which direction statistically i have maximum increase in distance okay and in which direction i have minimum increase in in distance between two particles i will be able to i will be able to form my strain ellipse okay so this is how it is done okay that uh, you know so this is a this is a set of set of deformed markers that i am observing in the field and this is how it is done place a sheet of tracing paper or the powder paper that we have been using for our strain unit example uh, either directly on the surface of the slab of the rock or on a photograph of the surface and mark the center of the strain markers draw a border draw a border parallel line uh, this is your base okay so what do i mean by that i i place a tracing paper here and then i draw all the centers of the of the individual grains on the tracing paper and then i draw a kind of a border around it okay now do not worry about the exact center of any given grain or object as the inaccuracy comes out in the statistical watch okay take another tracing paper draw border parallel lines mark a center of the point in the middle of the overlay sheet okay what will be your first fry plot and then superimpose it on one of the center so i take another uh, transparent sheet bring it here and you know so i have a transparent sheet a second transparent sheet i mark the center of the transparent sheet bring the transparent sheet here put it on the top of one grain okay on the center of one grain and from there you know from that particular point okay i then keep on marking where the other grains centers are i repeat and then what i do i take this transparent sheet again bring it to the second point you know and from there i mark where the other points are and then that particular process i keep on doing for the whole uh, whole cluster and finally i will come up with a picture which looks something like this okay but there will be a gap in between and there will be plenty of dots around it and this will be actually my strain ellipse okay and from here i can essentially know that what is the length of the maximum what is the length of the uh you know major axis what is the length of the minor axis and that would provide me the strain the bulk strain that this particular rock has suffered okay now <clears throat> that was done on a 
that was done on a part that is that was done on a particular surface it is 2d okay the same method can be done suppose i am i am i have a piece of rock i have piece of a rock body you know and where you know and i have these deformed sort of pebbles that i can see and then you know i can see that deformed pebble on this section on this section as well as on this section in all the three mutually perpendicular section so what i will do i will measure the length of the major axis and the length of the minor axis length of the major axis and length of the minor axis in all three mutually perpendicular faces okay okay and from there i can essentially create a flynn diagram okay just by doing x by y by y by z okay in a statistical way and that will provide me i can actually see i can make a flynn diagram in this particular case i can see uh, if i do that example this is this is done from the um, this is done on the rock exposures in a place called ghatchila near uh, near uh, near uh, in in eastern india uh, if i i mean if things happen properly i will take you here as well okay and if we will do this particular exercise by our hand looking at these exposures itself and you will be able to find out that most of the points actually lie very close to k equals to one line okay most of the points would lie uh with some exception of course these are exceptions these are exceptions but most of the points would lie near to k is equals to one line what does that mean if the points lie at k is equals to one line can someone tell me what does it mean can someone tell me what does that mean if it lies at the k equals to one line what sort of strain it is constrictional plane strain or uh, flattening type of strain tell me guys what type what type of strain it is if you remember this is a plane strain we talked about it if k is equals to 1 this is called plane strain ha huh? so there are other methods that uh, we are not discussing right now but uh, we will we will try to look at them during the field trip like wellman method bedding uh, bedin graph method or rfi method and these are the methods as well that are used for strain analysis too so i'll stop this class today here and i would entertain any question that you might have around strain analysis strain analysis on a <clears throat> with from strain markers does anyone have any question okay if not then i will uh, stop it here and uh, i'll see you on monday thank you